In this lecture, I'd like to describe some of the ideas we've been working on in regards to the possibility that the mind may have a fundamental role to play in connection with the construction of reality. Uh, so, there have been various uh, meetings to um, see what ideas people have got. Um, there's actually a, a book uh, that's come out with three of these conferences, but if, you, if you're interested, there's this website, inbiosa.eu, which has um, a position paper, it's a, a commission effort. Lots of people throwing out ideas for how this problem could be solved, and also a um, PowerPoint thing. Okay, but to get to my own approach now, um, you could put it as this question, what grounds physics? And there are two possibilities, the traditional one being something mathematical, and the newer one something to do with computation or uh, machine or, or mind. So let me uh, go through these. Um, uh, well, this all started off with a very important person at Trinity, um, uh, Isaac Newton. He uh, wrote down uh, equations for Newtonian mechanics. These fitted very well to the um, uh, phenomena like planetary orbits. So it's become a, a model for physics after that. Uh, one further um, triumph is Maxwell's equations, which did the same for electromagnetism, just four simple equations, uh, well, um, which um, describe the phenomena of electromagnetism. Well, that wasn't quite enough. There was uh, relativity made things a bit complicated, except Ma uh, Maxwell's equations already worked with relativity. But then there was quantum theory, and then things started to get uh, complicated. Uh, but the um, average person wouldn't have enough mathematics to understand it. But quantum theory then uh, described uh, things like um, atoms. Uh, you could um, uh, solve, well, you could do chemistry with it. You could grind the calculations and you would get um, uh, atoms and molecules that explained it all, uh, the chemical bond. Well, then things, of course, had to get a little more difficult. Uh, there's a many-body problem and then there was quantum electrodynamics, uh, the next most complicated theory and more difficult mathematics. That didn't uh, work for all the particles, it only encompassed um, the uh, common or garden particles. So uh, there were things like uh, mesons and baryons and so on, and uh, strange particles. Um, and, uh, but then something called the standard model came to the rescue. Um, the same sort of thing, but more elaborate, with uh, about 20 parameters, lots of fields. But that explained all the particles quite well. Uh, but then there's a little problem. There was a nice theory of gravity, uh, um, Einstein's general theory of relativity. So then, having unified the uh, three other forces, the weak, strong force and the electromagnetic forces, they tied those all together with um, much effort and lots of Nobel Prizes coming out. The next thing was, uh, well, obviously, adding gravity, and then encountered problems because gravity didn't uh, join in in any simple way. However, uh, the mathematicians got their heads together, came up with uh, supersymmetry, and uh, uh, you could, well, get gravity out of that, uh, but um, the problem you had to add extra dimensions, uh, 10 or 11 or something. And that was when it started to turn from um, physics into mathematics because, um, the, uh, well, for start, we don't see these extra dimensions, but there's a trick for um, getting rid of them. Uh, but still, they're, they're unphysical. And uh, further problems, they hoped that this would be the theory of everything, one theory which would explain everything, but unfortunately, the trick for getting rid of the extra dimensions could be done. I think 10 to the 520 different ways. So uh, that's a bit of embarrassment. It was more complicated than a standard model. Uh, well, uh, so I'd say um, it became general mathematics, elegant mathematics, and you might say dreaming because it no longer had any connection with the real world. Of course, people hope that there's a real world, but um, uh, nothing's been found that fits the theory 
um, specifically. So, um, uh, is it? Um, um, okay, well, uh, it so happened that in, I think it was 1976, I shared an office when I was visiting MIT with someone called Ed Fredkin, and he was working on uh, something to explain the universe in terms of bits. I'm not sure the precise model, but this is something, uh, probably the cellular automaton. Um, so, uh, anyway, he was trying to persuade people that this was a good um, model of reality. This, um, it's just, um, well, you've probably all heard of Conway's life game, which is an example of this. You have a lattice and you have rules which say how it evolves. So it's a kind of computation. Um, but um, let me say that there are really two strands. There's the um, formal models like um, the cellular automata, or they're more biological models. Now I'll go into each of these in some detail in the next. Slide, here are various names. Uh, Wolfram is the person who um, uh, who's best known because of his book, uh, New Science of um, New Kind of Science, I think it's called. Um, okay, well let me now follow up this direction, just say that there's these two differences, things which are more mechanical and things which are more biological. Um, Okay, well, what's the point about these cellular automata? Um, well, people found when you run this model, interesting things happen. And the idea was that these interesting things might account for the strange behavior in quantum mechanics, uh, which is what you could call emergent behavior. Uh, new things emerge from old, and so that, that was one reason why people were interested in them. Another thing, uh, I think... Um, Wolfram did a lot of work uh, trying, adjusting all sorts of rules and he found some rules had rather interesting behaviour and instead of rather simple behaviour, repetitive, he found in a certain range you've got um, complex behaviour. And um, one thing people found is that uh, out of these models you could construct something called the universal Turing machine and the universal ma Turing machine is uh, something that um, can do any calculation. This was uh, Turing's great, great contribution to computation, or should I, should I say one of his great contributions. Um, uh, Turing wanted to pin down what actually a well-defined calculation was, and he, uh, he said it's composed of these things, and he furthermore found you could define a, a set of rules, uh, this universal Turing machine, which could do any calculation of a certain kind. Um, of course, the, the modern computer can do that, but this was the most uh, basic form. Uh, uh, it had um, uh, a system which changed according to certain rules, and it had a tape it could write on, and that could do anything. So, uh, anyway, these cellular automata, because you could build a universal Turing machine from them, could do any calculation, which um, is sort of uh, an impressive thing. Uh, okay, but I haven't got on well, that part, I don't think, um, and people are still thinking about what they can do. But I'm more interested in the more biological strand. And uh, uh, this uh, well, story as far as I'm concerned, well, David Bohm uh, did some interesting things, but um, Wheeler did the, the interesting things. There's an amazing article he wrote called Law Without Law, which you can find if you search on that. Um, and uh, a few other things, the idea of it from bit. But anyway, um, he, perhaps I could do some quotes from him. Um, Recent decades have taught us that physics is a magic window. He's very poetic. It shows us that the illusion that lies behind the reality and the reality that lies behind illusion. Sorry, it shows us the illusion that lies behind reality and the reality that lies behind, behind it, illusion. Its scope is immensely greater than we once realized. We are no longer satisfied with insights only into particles or fields of force or geometry or even space and time. He uh, worked on um, uh, the, how um, well, activity in space and time, uh, theories where you didn't have a fixed space and time but there were things like wormholes. So he was interested in space-time as a physical thing. 
Anyway, today we might demand a physic some understanding of existence himself. Well, probably not many physicists would get to that level, but that was something that um, Wheeler was interested in. In fact, he, he said, this is the uh, thing I want to sort out at the end of my life, uh, this, this problem. Okay, um, another quote. Um, if the views we're exploring here, which I'll say something about in a moment, are correct, <coughs> one principle, observer participancy, suffices to build everything. Well, okay, well, what did Wheeler have in mind? Well, in uh, quantum mechanics, there's a thing called wave function collapse. And a simple illustration of this is you have a source, you have waves coming out of it. You also have a detector. Now, the funny thing about quant the quantum world is that things sometimes behave like waves <coughs> and sometimes like particles. And these, um, this source produces something which um, acts like a wave because you can do interference experiments with it and so on. On the other hand, a detector will register all the energy focused on a point, which is something strange. Uh, the way you, and then uh, if, it, if, it, if the thing can go on past the detector and it's not absorbed by it, it then its position has been observed and, it, and you can then pick it up on its trajectory. Okay, so, um, okay, we have this collapse, but the thing is, different observations collapse in different ways. If you observe something different, you have a different kind of collapse. This is not airy fairy philosophy. There's a very definite uh, equations for it, and it fits experiment. So it's um, the world acts as if we make an observation, and then this collapse thing occurs. So he then his idea behind law without law is that if you um, observed in the right way, you might even uh, be able to create universes and affect the laws of the universe. So he, uh, uh, this I think was basically speculation, but he, he had the idea that um, after a big bang there'd be a, a very vague universe, which is the kind of thing in quantum mechanics, <coughs> lots of things there at once, and then life would appear, and it would start observing, and it would start shaping reality until you've got the kind of universe we've got now. Uh, but he didn't really um, have much to say about uh, much idea as to how that would actually happen. There was no mathematics there. Um, so, if you want this observer participancy process, it's participancy because you don't just observe as in classical mechanics, you do something when you observe, you are a participator in creating reality. Um, you would need some kind of organized process, really, if you wanted to build a universe. Well, then, uh, various people have uh, got ideas on this. Um, Hammeroff and Penrose wanted to, uh, they're actually interested in what consciousness did. Um, Hammeroff is an anesthesiologist, and actually he's interested in consciousness since his job is getting rid of it and, and bringing it back again afterwards. Um, Penrose is a physicist who, who's uh, had, um, was trying to try fix some problems. Uh, well, their idea, let me quote, um, that is um, a network of microtubules, those are things in the brain which um, uh, they thought might act as a computer, um, can tune itself appropriately to achieve control of its own state of superposition and reduction. Again, this was somewhat nebulous. Uh, Henry Stapp, on the other hand, was interested in how the mind would fit into physics. Um, and he had some interesting things. Uh, he, well, his idea essentially was that you can't fit this observation process into physics. It would be something external, and uh, the mind sort of was something extra which grasped reality and made decisions. In fact, let me have a quote. This is uh, typically um, involved language of Henry Stapp, who is a very precise sort of person. He tries to be completely rigorous. The conscious act is represented physically by the selection of new top-down, top-level code, which then automatically exercises top-level control over the flow of neural excitations in the brain through the action of the quantum theoretic laws of nature. The unity of conscious thought comes from the unifying integrative character of the conscious creative act, which selects a single code from among the multitude generated by the causal development prescribed by quantum theory. Okay, but how does, how does it happen? Uh, 
he d I don't think he has equations for that, especially since mind, he said mind wasn't um, included in quantum theory, so he was just invoking, postulating the mind acted in a certain way. Well, uh, one thing I've been interested in uh, since the 70s is mind matter unification. I might just give my motivation for this. But I've been involved with a lot of um, uh, somewhat heretical things which, in which it seems mind plays a more important part than is allowed for in physics. One of these is Eastern philosophy, and I mentioned the book of Kapfer, which was one of my introductions to it. Uh, paranormal phenomena, which um, seem to be pretty well um, proved by experiments. Uh, you might be interested to look on the um, university media site for a talk that Rupert Sheldrake gave in the Winch Sandy lecture room, uh, where he described his experiments on telephone telepathy. Well, that suggests minds can do interesting things. Um, and, uh, oh yes, I collaborated with a um, musicologist in Trinity about um, the nature of music, why music has these very specific structures. Again, that pointed to something beyond what we know at this time. Okay, so, um, right, um, but more recently, as I said, I've been involved with um, a collaboration involving someone called Alexa Yardley who um, contacted me with an idea uh, called Circular Theory, and we've been collaborating on this. Um, you might say that she's young and I'm Pauli, she's the mystic and <laughs> I'm the scientist, and Jung and Pauli try to connect the ideas, and pretty much the same thing's been happening in this case. So let me, um, uh, this book, um, uh, you can get uh, Circular Theory on the web, I'm not sure how you might have a problem understanding it, but perhaps you, you'll be a little more comprehensible <laughs> after this talk, I don't know. But anyway, um, uh, I've produced my own take on it, and I'm going to describe it in terms which I think are reasonably um, okay with science. Now, so the theory involves two main ideas. Uh, critical grouping, that's sort of um, essentially saying the same thing as a circular theory, uh, templates, which is a, I think is behind a lot of her thinking, is my own way of describing it. So, what um, is critical grouping? Well, um, okay, a critical point is a point of balance. Um, uh, it's a thing that happens, say, when you go from a non-magnetic to a magnetic state, and things start to become unstable and move. Um, there's lots of uh, variability and uncertainty in the critical state. Um, and grouping is, well, ordinary grouping, things coming together into groups and coming apart. So the idea is that things can fairly easily move, um, join together or spin <coughs> apart. Uh, now, groups are interesting. They, they occur in various places in physics. Uh, uh, one thing is uh, networks. Um, you make a network out of a group of things which um, work together to produce an interesting result. Um, computer programs do that or else you, well, I mean, everyone's familiar with networks and what they do. The other thing is a, a template, well, I'll get into that. A, a template will be something with a number of parts connected together in a particular way. Okay, so, yeah, let me now start elaborating this point of template, which seems to be behind uh, Alexa Yardley's thinking and uh, seems to be extremely productive in what it can do. Okay, well, let me uh, say what's important about a template. Um, well, you use a template to sort of help you construct something. Um, we had something recently at home, something which um, is used to assemble um, a thing which collects rainwater coming down the pipe, and that comes with a template. You, you stick this structure on your pipe, and you cut where the line, <laughs> lines are marked. So that's clearly um, a form, these, these lines, which are guiding an action. Okay, so uh, that's roughly what a template is. And, um, okay, let me go through some examples. Um, DNA and RNA are um, examples because the 
uh, here you've got a collection, this string, which is a special kind of group, and the elements of that string are uh, telling you something. Uh, well, this, this comes in various forms. Uh, the RNA uh, uh, governs uh, the proteins, and these proteins then do things, so the, it's a kind of template for doing things. It's, a, I think, a useful way of thinking of it. Um, language is another kind of template. Um, it's a string which guides an action, and in the case of language, it has a, um, a particular form which guides the actions corresponding to it. Okay, that's the template. Um, oh yeah, two important templates are psych cycles and the group and group operation. Cycle is something which goes through in a cycle, and if you have something which is intrinsically cyclic, like it goes through in a particular sequence, this can then guide other repeating actions. So this is a special kind of template at work. Grouping and ungrouping, um, this is just one thing, say, splitting into two or going together, which you recall is the basic thing of the um, critical grouping. And uh, that could pull uh, two things apart. Supposing you have uh, one thing attached to something and it is pulled apart, that could move something else apart. Equally, you could move pull things together. Okay, so this is starting to show what um, templates, the kind of template over here. Uh, one particularly important example is uh, replication. Uh, uh, right. Um, you could say uh, you know, DNA, uh, DNA is made of two complementary strands, and you could say each is a template for the other. Um, you know, strand one assembles strand two. What it does is to collect complementary nucleotides until you get the chain. Uh, and these split, and here's the general scheme. U sort of assembles V, then it splits, and then V can assemble U, and so you replicate your original U. Now, the uh, point of circular theory is that this might be a, a general thing. Um, uh, let's see, another example. Um, not, well, there's all sorts of cases where one thing gives rise to a second thing, and um, this produces the first thing back again. So, for example, if a word, a word and a corresponding action, the word generates the action, then the action generates the word again. Um, if you have a system designed to do that. In fact, this is, a, I guess, one of these assembly processes. Um, uh, okay, now, um, well, the whole point is that these are things which we know about in biology, but there's absolutely no reason why we should be confined to, general, to biology. So, um, they might be universal. These these patterns which um, we find in ordinary biology may happen at a more fundamental level. So this now raises the question, is biology the product of physics, which is what um, is usually assumed. Um, ordinary biology comes from physics and chemistry, and these in turn come from mathematics. Uh, so it's the mathematical strand. But um, there seems no reason why all these processes couldn't have their own biology. So there's a, as it were, a subtle form of life which is entirely these um, patterns. Now, some, some people um, suggest that, in fact, uh, uh, life occurs in all sorts of forms. Um, now, if I can remember this um, title of this uh, symposium, um, well, maybe it'll come to me, but if you, if you look at my um, lecture collection on the um, university video site, that's um, one of the ones, um, which I can't remember the name of it now, but uh, uh, it's, it's um, I suppose if you search for Hokkaido on the university site, the chances are you'll find that video, that's where it took place. The Hokkaido 8 Symposium took place in the same as place as G8 took place, so it was called the H8 Symposium. Okay. Um, so life might be much more universal, so maybe something more fundamental than biology and physics. Um, now, Wheeler is saying 
the observer participant C might be the basis of everything, whereas Yardley is saying essentially circling circles, um, which are the basis of everything. And of course, you can't just say that it's um, the basis of everything. You have to say that there's this apparatus that we've been talking about, all these funny things happen, and that could be this other form of life. So, uh, can I get it anywhere? Um, well, the thesis uh, that I just described is saying biology is all pervasive, um, not just chemistry based. Now, uh, let me see where this might get us. Um, <clears throat> one thing is that particular forms uh, dominate. Now, this is obvious in biology, there are things like uh, replication, um, reproduction, um, uh, feeding and so on, uh, getting food for energy, all sorts of things are universal, or at least they're very widespread in the biological realm. Um, so, uh, you say when this system runs, if you, if you let it run, assuming it's universal, then some things are going to predominate. The reason that these templates have useful results, uh, a system which looks out for food is obviously going to survive better than a system that doesn't. Um, uh, here I've got uh, examples, um, yeah I've got them down here, use of science, well I come to these later, these are the kind of things which you would expect to appear if you had everything going together at this subtle level. And certainly I hope I'm recording this, I'll put it on the uh, website later. Um, uh, okay, now, gosh, we need evolution. What's needed for evolution is, um, first of all, structures. So you assume there are structures, and these some of these will be stable, but there, are, there can also be mutations um, if they, um, has to be a mechanism which decides that something ought to change, makes it more likely to change, and then you can get a modification of the structure. You can even, um, Yardley makes the analogy with computers, that there can be bits, because you might have a bit of structure, uh, a component of structure which can act like a bit. You may, for example, switch from one thing or split into two, and that two can even have a continuously var variable if it rotates. So you've got um, a lot of apparatus there, which can, and especially if it can act like a computer in this way, um, could lead to evolution and hence much more complicated things. So it's all the, this mechanism by which uh, simple cycling, um, a simpler <coughs> thing she talks about is something, two things cycling around each other, but then you get complexes of each cycle. These could evolve, and certain things will, be, will evolve because they're important. One of these things is um, called semiosis. This is an idea of Pierce, and that is actually three things acting together, sign, object, and interpretant, which links them together. There's a particular way which Pierce analyzed in detail in which things can act as signs, and this all develops through habits. So uh, this kind of system, as it evolves, would, you'd expect to be, become specialized, just as life gets specialized in particular things. One of these is this um, application of signs. Now, once you've evolved to a point where there are signs, you can then get um, logic, for example. To get logic, you um, uh, have, say, propositions which can be true or false, and then you want to combine these in ways which are representing true or false. So you can see things get gradually more elaborate. Uh, in fact, you could then build formal systems, uh, including mathematics. Oh, okay, let me just go back here. Um, one thing which Suzanne Langer, uh, philosopher Suzanne Langer pointed out in a book called Philosophy in a New Key, is there are two kinds of symbols. Uh, ones that denote things and ones which act sort of internally. Science deals what wants um, to get things under control and say that this means that, so you have uh, uh, um, descriptions of reality. But uh, uh, aesthetics, um, art, involves a different application of symbol. So uh, she says basically some symbols are power symbols. Um, and uh, uh, this sort of fits uh, this collaboration with. Um, Former member of this college, Technol Tefis Carpenter. Here is, um, if you want to see the um, 
a paper we wrote at a, conf a conference on consciousness. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, yes, this is capital K W C M S and then a little s, abbreviated uh, form. But you can find it just by going to my home pages and following links, publications, music, just as well. Anyway, uh, it turns out that this fits quite well. Um, it, it, this was based on um, her musical knowledge of what um, themes do, um, what composers thought about themes. It fits quite nicely into this picture, so that's an additional plus. But I said that there's, besides this, there are these formal systems which denote something. Um, well, then uh, mathematical structures. Well, mathematics is a formal system. Once you've got a formal system, your, your um, life form might be able to use it to um, build mathematical structures. Um, the way they could do it would be essentially trying to connect. Now, this is the connection theme. Make a, what he calls a circle, special group, linking an internal structure with an external structure. And once you've got that, you can uh, impose, or try to impose features on your external structures. In other words, um, make a mathematical form out of them. Okay. Um, so, uh, basically, this is a way um, Charles Wheeler's problem shows how this circular theory can go through various stages, more and more complex structures, till you get universes. And since symmetry plays such a small, large role in uh, uh, conventional physics, one might, for example, speculate that these systems are applying symmetry. Incidentally, I give an example of application of symmetry uh, which is grinding of telescopes, that you, uh, um, uh, the way you grind a telescope is you first, telescope mirror, is you first make a spherical mirror, and you do it by me simply moving a mirror over a tool uh, with some grinding material, and that turns it into a sphere. And the reason it's a sphere is because that's um, got a symmetry group associated with it. So <laughs> these entities are sort of grinding out or shaping a universe that's kind of observed in the same way. Okay, now um, let me just um, finish off by saying uh, things about it. Um, well, uh, one of the things I'm interested in is intelligent design. Now, I think that people may surprise people is there's a connection between Trinity and intelligent design. Is that there's a Lord, Lord Mackay, who's an honorary fellow of Trinity. And he is very much connected with intelligent design. He's one of the people in charge of the Centre of Intelligent Design in Edinburgh. And he chaired a meeting, uh, well, a lecture by this chap, Stephen Meyer, in London. Um, and he confirmed he was the same Lord Mackay, who was a, an honorary fellow of Trinity. And the trouble with intelligent design is that people won't accept that it's a scientific process. Now, Stephen Meyer, I should say, has an impeccable background. He is, has a a PhD in philosophy from Cambridge University. And he has a very rigorous treatment of it, uh, essentially uh, analysing the cell and, and saying it seems a bit inexplicable. Anyway, he, he, he treats it in a very proper philosophical way, and as it, his book, Signature of the Cell, um, goes into detail. And I think also his lecture is on YouTube. Okay. Um, however, this has become politicised. Uh, people insist that there's a connection with the, um, uh, let's see, the standard creationism, and that this is just creationism in disguise. Well, I, I can show you it's clearly not. Uh, a lot of scientists have come to a view that this is uh, uh, that you need um, postulating intelligence as a thing, and uh, one of my points is we don't mind. Uh, intelligence in one context, namely human beings. So what is wrong with postulating um, intelligence elsewhere if it helps you understand uh, biology? And uh, you can say this is God, but you don't have to. Treat it as a scientific enterprise and see where it gets you. Now, I don't think very much... Uh, intelligent design people haven't done very much on the question of what is intelligence, but this kind of theory would sort of close the gap by allowing it to connect with, um, well, by providing a model of intelligence. 
so as I said, it's got entirely political, very heated. People won't accept, won't view it as a scientific enterprise. There's another U U YouTube video which is somewhat over the top called Expelled, No Intelligence Allowed. Uh, somebody investigated what happened to people who dared <laughs> do things like I'm doing, saying intelligence design might be, um, there might be something to it. They um, lost their jobs or something. It's pretty that while this was going on, pictures of what happens in what the Nazis did, I mean, <laughs> which I don't think helps. Anyway, uh, uh, this is, that's called um, intelligence, um, no, expelled, no intelligence allowed. Uh, politics has also uh, interfered with this project, I'm afraid. There was a, um, uh, a project, um, well, yeah, uh, okay, the point of this is you might say, well, how can you make this more rigorous? Um, one answer is to do computer modelling. Well, I did have a student begin computer modelling back in 1995, a namesake of uh, the, uh, uh, the Chancellor of the Exchequer. If you search for George Osborne Cogprints, I think the Chancellor of the Exchequer hasn't uh, published anything on Cogprints, so that'll get you to his, his uh, paper. Um, Okay, so he actually did a computer model which um, was somewhat similar to this. It was based on a, um, an idea of a mathematician called hyperstructures. So he got a computer simulation which showed that this works, so showed hyperstructures could be a valid idea, it learned a skill. And then it encountered people who um, couldn't understand the mathematics and said this is not a good project and it was blocked. Uh, I took the opportunity um, uh, to write something about this. Um, we have till half past six, I think, so we're doing quite well. Um, incidentally, um, oh, I'll say that in a minute. Um, right, okay, there's also a video when progress and politics collide, which is actually a clip from a lecture of mine. Um, but anyway, um, the, one of the editors of a Russian language journal, Low Temperature Physics, which is translated into English, asked if I'd like to write something to celebrate 50 years since the first paper on the junction. So I said, maybe, will you censor what I write? And he said, no, we won't. True to the word, they let me have a section when progress and politics collide, which is about um, more or less. Okay, that's more or less what I said. I just mentioned this. Um, strange collaboration. Um, Alexa wrote to me a few years ago saying, I have some ideas you might be interested in. They sounded uh, pretty crazy, but also intriguing. So uh, what seems to be is that she has a kind of picture of uh, things circling and interacting in certain ways, and it's something which is really um, hard to describe. She couldn't really describe it, but just say things. And so uh, I've gradually been finding out that you can explain them in scientific terms and putting together this theory. So um, I think I'll close there. Thank you very much. <laughs>